So um, I'm Sophia Christie. I'm going to be um, chairing today. I'm a consultant um, mainly in organisation design and development, but I have a history as a chief exec in the NHS, um, mainly in commissioning activity and with a lot of work on um, both tackling health inequalities and using data to um, to improve health. So I'm chairing and I'm joined by um, Taz from um, ODSL who will be keeping an eye on the chat. So do use that for comments, questions. We do um, keep the chat, we use it in the blog um, that we write up at the end of um, each event and uh, it means that kind of we can make sure that people have seen comments and um, raised questions even if we don't get to um, cover everything as we're going through the discussion so do make active use of that. Um, our main speaker today is going to be Sarah Scobie from um, the Nuffield Trust. Sarah's been doing work across the health and care interface over the last few years, but in particular has published a number of reports that have focused on um, black and ethnic minority access to services and the um, uh, significance of whether or not we're recording ethnicity in terms of being able to understand what is actually happening around um, access and process of health service delivery from um, people across the range of diverse communities that we have using health services in England and the the focus of that work has been um, on England although obviously has implications for the wider NHS and Mark um, from his home background of Kent hospitals um, began to notice patterns in data of access and use of services that implied that um, there were quite significant inequalities in everyday delivery of services, um, which then led to um, the hospital and um, Mark in his wider roles, uh, beginning to look at what might be some of those drivers of um, inequality and what would be the ways of um, intervening. And obviously, for many of you, um, the the interest and attention here is, um, you know, how do we get better data so that we've got good input that allows us to make sensible policy decisions um, but there'll also be a number of you from policy and management backgrounds who are kind of interested in the so what you know if, if we know this is going on what can we do to um, intervene and hopefully we'll um, cover kind of both elements of that as we go through the discussion. So I think we're up to about 54 um people and um we're five minutes in so sarah do you want to um kick us off and sarah's going to present for about 15 um minutes and then um feel free to make comments and raise questions during that time using the chat um but then we'll have a bit of space for um conversation and questions around that before we um go into mark's input so sarah Great, thank you very much. So I'm just going to start off by sharing my screen and hopefully you can all see that. Yep. 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 Uh, great, okay. Um, sorry, I'm looking slightly confused because it's moved my screen. Can you still see that? Hopefully I'm now looking yep. at, at the camera and my screen at the same time. So that's great. So thank you very much um, for having me. Um, and um, as Sophia mentioned, I'm from the Nuffield Trust where I'm Deputy Director of Research. I've been here for about five years. And before that, I was in various um, health analytics and research roles for more years than I really want to remember. Um, so just to start off, in case you're not aware of us, um, a little bit about the Nuffield Trust. So we're um, a health think tank. We uh, undertake research, we assess evidence, we engage with policymakers, 
um, and in order to um, improve improve policy making and and therefore improve health and social care. Um, over the years, we've done quite a lot of work on health inequalities. So down here is an example from um, our Quality Watch program, which looks at health inequalities, where we looked at changes in inequalities. We've done some quite specific work, for example, on um, uh, particular groups, so prisoners, and most recently women in prison, um, and also looked at some of the wider factors. So work, uh, my colleague Liz uh, led on childhood obesity and the relationship with where you live. On ethnicity specifically, um, a couple of years ago, we did an analysis of the quality of ethnicity coding in hospital data. And this was initially driven by us wanting to understand this better um, and kind of recognizing that perhaps we weren't doing as much analysis of ethnicity as we could do because we were kind of taking it as read the data quality wasn't very good without actually challenging ourselves to say well what do we know about the data quality what could we do with it um, so following on from that work we um, have then done some work, particularly looking at elective care and the changes that took place during COVID. And I'll say a little bit more about that project um, as, as we go along. And both of those pieces of work were in collaboration with the um, NHS Race and Health Observatory, um, who are obviously very interested in this area. So I'm just going to start off in the first part of the presentation with a little bit it's sort of generally about ethnicity and health and what do we and don't we know and why it's challenging to undertake analysis. Um, so there are, are some areas where there is very strong evidence of inequalities in health. So COVID-19 is the most recent one um, where there have been differences in infection, treatment outcomes, mortality, um, um, vaccination rates, but there are some really long standing differences as well in relation to mental health and, ma and maternity, for example, where despite knowing about ethnic differences and inequalities for a long time, um, there doesn't seem to be um, the action that is, is needed or ways to address the underlying reasons. Um, then there are some areas where we know about ethnic differences um, and ethnic variations, but actually services have been able to respond better. So I think cardiovascular disease is, a, is an example where there are differences between ethnic groups with the um, Asian group, for example, having, having higher rates, but where in terms of both preventive services treatment, there is, um, there is good engagement by services in understanding and addressing those populations to, to a, you know, a, a significant degree. Um, there are some areas where uh, actually um, minority ethnic groups have have better outcomes or um, a better risk factor. So overall mortality is actually lower for uh, most ethnic groups um, and rates of smoking and alcohol consumption. Um, a lower rates of breastfeeding are higher. So I suppose what I'm trying to get across is it, it's a complicated picture and it's very easy to dive in and say there's ethnic inequalities, but unless we really understand what's going on, we're not going to make the, the actions and, and get the responses right um, to understand what the issues are. Um, and finally, just to say there are a whole load of areas where we actually know very little about ethnic differences. Um, and so elective care was something we looked at last year and we couldn't find very much previous work on it at all. Um, when we looked at things like the uh, national clinical audits, their recording of ethnicity is uh, very, very poor. Um, and so there are whole areas that really could, could be investigated quite a lot further. Um, and I think it's fair to say that there's a few reasons why perhaps people haven't um, undertaken as much analysis of ethnicity as a um, as a cause of variation. Some of those are are much broader at the extent to which policymakers are interested in health inequalities, which has waxed and waned over time. But there are some issues that I think are more specific to to ethnicity, and I think um, it's worth just thinking about a few of those. So I'm going to run through run through some of these issues in a bit more detail now. Um, 
so I think the one example is that, um, or one general issue is the sort of the broad ethnic groups that, that we talk about in the UK. So um, Asian, black, mixed, other white, um, actually have huge variation within them. And so this particular example is um, from the GP patient survey, and it's the percent of patients who were put off having an appointment during COVID. This is from the 2021 survey. And I've highlighted in a darker color all of the all of the groups which would form part of the Asian group. Um, and what you see is really they're distributed across, across the range of of, um, of ethnic groups. And if you if you aggregate data to those broader levels, which very often you need to do for practical reasons that I'll come on to, um, you're gonna miss a lot of that granularity. Um, and so, so there's a lot of complexity with, um, with a lot of variation within groups as well as between groups to, to take account of. I think one of the other things that's often um, a challenge is that ethnicity doesn't sit on its own. And increasingly with inequalities, there's you know, a, a stronger and welcome focus on the interactions between ethnicity, deprivation, gender. Um, but um, that, that does uh, really need to be taken into account with, um, with ethnicity because we know that um, uh, people from ethnic groups are more likely to live in more deprived areas, to be concentrated also geographically in cities. Um, so there are all kinds of other differences in terms of access to services and the um, range of services available that, um, uh, that will be different. So this is an example um, looking at the proportion of babies born in each deprivation decile, so the deprivation deciles around the side and the broad ethnic groups um, along the top. And what you see for all of the ethnic groups is you have more babies born in more deprived areas, younger populations often as a result uh, and resulting from, but these differences are really extremely stark for some ethnic groups. Um, so 20% so of black babies are born in the most depraved um, um, decile. So you get some of these um, really long-standing and inbuilt um, uh, interrelationships between ethnicity and deprivation and other factors. And there are, um, you know, whichever area you look at, there are going to be other things that crop up. So with COVID, I think occupational differences and household structure became sort of more prominent. Um, the next thing to really bear in mind is how big the differences are in age structures between different populations. So this is just a snapshot from the 2021 census, um, just for two ethnic groups, white and Asian. Um, and you'll see um, just the huge difference in, in age structure. And so this is really important because if, if you don't take account of age in your analysis, then what you might end up doing is just be comparing uh, a, po a, a population of older people and a population of younger people and the ethnicity, you know, you might completely misinterpret what's going on with ethnicity. Um, and the other factor to bear in mind is that in terms of numbers of people, particularly for conditions that are more likely to affect older people, um, small numbers for uh, ethnic groups, particularly at a local level, are, are going to become a challenge for analysis. So that's something that really um, is, is uh, uh, needs to be taken into account. On the plus side, the fact that we've got the 2021 census now is absolutely fantastic because the work that we did uh, last year um, on ethnicity in the elective care, it was really difficult to find good quality denominators for our analysis. Um, and, that, um, and that makes, um, robust analysis really complicated. So um, just one more slide on, on some of the challenges in terms of ethnicity analysis, and that's really to do with the coding. So we did a detailed study looking at the quality of the um, hospital uh, data set, so inpatient, outpatient, um, and a little bit on A&E. Um, and, uh, and what we found, backed up some other work. For example, ONS have done a lot of this work comparing the coding in hospital data linked to census data, which they can look at. Um, and you get some big 
you get not just differences um, in the coding uh, in hospital data, but also that there is systematic bias in those. So people from minority ethnic groups are far less likely to have the same ethnicity code. They're far more likely to be grouped into some kind of other category um, or to have different ethnic codes for different episodes of care. Um, and, and the net result of all of that is that um, what you often have is fewer people identified is, as black, Asian, mixed, for example, and more people identified as other. Um, so this is just a snapshot from the report of trust level data. So in some trusts, um, more than a third of people were identified as being in the other group. Um, and the challenge for analysts is that if you looked at the denominator data for those areas, you wouldn't have nearly as, as high a proportion of other people. So you, you've always got this mismatch where you're over counting other and under counting other groups, um, which makes making sense of the data really complicated. Um, and uh, you know, there's a link to the to the to the report, and there's a lot more detail in there about some of the other variations that we found. So um, those are some of the challenges. Um, and uh, knowing those, last year we set ourselves the task of trying to. Uh, make use of of data as best we can so recognizing that there's a lot that needs to be done to improve data but also actually how practically can can we use the data um, and so we we did a project that was um, looking at this lost activity so you've all seen charts like this um, of the drops in elective activity that happened um, during covid and are trying to understand whether there were differences between ethnic groups in in lost activity um, and the reason why this is so important is because the uh, waiting lists have been continuing to go up um, and access to care is going to be a challenge for years to come and there's a real tension between what could be done to perhaps rapidly reduce waiting lists um, by changing pathways um, and what needs to be done to make sure that access is equitable and that the changes you put in place to um, improve access don't in themselves um, make it more difficult to, um, to uh, make care available in, in an accessible way. So we looked at a set of common procedure groups, um, both diagnostic and therapeutic. Um, and I'm just gonna show a couple of um, a few slides with just a couple of, um, of things that we found. So one of the things that we found, which I think perhaps we hadn't anticipated, was just how big the variation in rates of procedures was prior to COVID. Um, so up here, we've got cardiac diagnostic procedures, um, and you can see the Asian group has much higher, higher rates, which fits with the epidemiology um, and so that's kind of reassuring there. You'll see that the other group is pretty high for all of them. And I think a lot of that's to do with some of the coding issues that I mentioned. In this work, we used a methodology that the um, UK Health Security Agency also used to use people's previous uh, records um, to, uh, um, to effectively uh, if they've got a missing ethnic group or an, uh, or another group in the data that we were analysing, but they had a more specific code in earlier records, then we would use that. So we reduce the amount of missing of missing data. But even so, we've still got this other category, which is very big. Um, but some of the other findings were less clear. So from the evidence that's available, there's very little data that or research that we could find that would explain why the white group had such a um, an increased rate of um, hip and knee replacements so perhaps pointing to access being an issue there cataract procedures we found very big differences um, which are possibly related to diabetes which is a risk factor for cataracts but again the national cataract audit 
only has the ethnic group, I think, of about 40% of people. So um, some real opportunities to um, understand what's going there better. Um, dental procedures, again, some interesting patterns um, that might relate more to access to general dental practitioners um, as much as to, to hospital care. So some really big differences before COVID. Um, and then we looked at the falls in activity um, across ethnic groups. So these on the left are the falls for each of our ethnic groups and then everything else and then all procedures um, compared to the pre-COVID year for that group. Um, and so you'll see that uh, the falls were much greater for some types of, of activity than for others. So much greater for hips and knees, for example, and for cardiacs, but all of them fell significantly. Um, and then on the right, we've got uh, whether those falls were, were bigger or larger compared with the white group using that as a reference group. Um, and so what we found systematically was that the Asian group, the falls were, were bigger. Um, and um, we've, we looked also at regions and deprivations, um, and um, there is, uh, it's difficult to know exactly why this is, but in terms of um, people not coming forward, um, more reluctance to use services, uh, more difficulty engaging with perhaps digital pathways, all of these things, because this happened across all of these different procedures suggest that that might be a, a particular problem for the Asian group. Um, dental was the only one where actually there was a opposite direction of variation with the white group, um, which possibly relates to um, level of acuity, but, but difficult to be sure. I think the other thing, just to go back to the point about the volumes of people and numbers is important to bear in mind that um, those percentage differences when you translate them to um, uh, um, to numbers are, are clearly very, very important, but much smaller than the differences that there were pre-COVID in the rates. So it's just worth bearing in mind the what the overall picture was before COVID. Um, and just to say that we also looked at deprivation. So there were systematic differences with deprivation um, and some regional differences that were perhaps less clear. So I popped up here just a summary of the findings, but there's a link to, to the full report there. Um, and so just sort of overall in conclusion, um, uh, the, the ethnic variations, ethnic epidemiology is, is complicated. The reasons for variation and in inequalities are multifactorial and deprivation and geography are, are really important. And I think those, those differences are really important to understand if we want to know what the right interventions are um, and, um, and, and what the NHS should be doing about them. Um, for lots of service areas, there's limited evidence and analysis and, and data quality and systematic coding differences um, hamper understanding and action. And that is me done for the presentation, but happy to take questions. Thanks, Sarah. So um, we've got a, we've had a few people join us during that. So that was um, Sarah Scobie talking us through the um, why we might want to pay attention to um, the ethnicity of um, service users and also the complexity of um, trying to, to do that. If people can um, type their questions into the chat and comments, that's probably um, the easiest way of um, me being able to pick them up and um, direct them to Sarah. We had a, a couple of points of clarification, Sarah, while you were talking. One was just from your first slide, the um, Nuffield introduction, you had your um, little index of um, inequality and we had a query as to was higher on the index more unequal. So that was just your little um, exemplary graph. Um, and I 
just to check as well on your comparison of pre and post COVID, presumably those were age standardised comparisons. Yes. So the pre and post COVID, those were age and sex standardised and we used um, the ethpop populations um, because at the time the census wasn't available. Um, for those and yes the index I can I'll find in a minute uh, before the session the sessions ended a link to the inequalities work that I put a little graphic from earlier um, yes yeah, so we we created an index that was a comparison of the most leaves least deprived group um, but we we standardized the direction of it so that it uh, all of the indicators um a larger variation is more inequality and i'm going to come to mark but we further kind of question of clarification you referred to um the uk health security um uh, methodology for filling in missing data can you tell us a bit more about how that works and how we access it sarah yes so um Again, I'll pop the link to the report into the chat because that's got it in more detail and it's got a reference to the UK Health Security Agency. But basically, um, we uh, looked at the at other ethnic other other ethnic codes. So, so if in our in our index uh, admission, for example where the procedure was that we were looking at in our uh, um, analysis, we had an, um, a detailed ethnic code for that person, then we use that. If we didn't have one, then we looked back at previous activity for that patient to see if any of those um, had a specific eth ethnic code that we could use. Um, I will put that into the... Um, into the detail and Liz has already put a link to the GitHub code so anybody can uh, look in a lot more detail there as well but I'll, 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 I'll pop the detail into it. Thanks Sarah and um, so people know if you go on the Nuffield Trust website there you can download pdfs of um all of the pieces of work that sarah's been talking about and more if you want to um go and look at the um the reports in more detail mark i think you had a couple of other questions for sarah well i i've i followed what you told me to do sphere so i wrote them in the chat um i, I think one of them the first one that's in there i was going to ask sarah if she might answer it but uh, and the other two are kind of, well, one's been dealt with, which is the code one. And one is a kind of more existential question of how people like Sarah and I kind of work together better. So it's not sort of over there while I'm just busy sending sit reps off to NHS England all day. You know, how do I, how do I really, really maximize the work that Sarah's doing? Because if I challenge myself, I'd say, I don't know if I have actually, because I'm just really, really busy telling the chief operating officer how many people there are in ED at the moment, for example. Um, yeah. So that that's a, something to kind of to think on. The first question I'd put in there, Sarah, you, you got to it on your last slide. And I mean, maybe it's probably something for a, a few hours, which we haven't got. But um, I'm, I'm just interested in your initial thoughts on that, because you start yeah. to allude to it on that last slide about if these if these differences exist, why do they exist? OK, do they exist because people are different to each other? So maybe sickle cell. Mm. Um, or have we, so hi, that's hypothesis one, it's to do with some some marker about you. And the second hypothesis is people from certain backgrounds might find it harder to access healthcare. And then the third one, potentially, if you move down those levels, is there may be some bias in the system. So people may, for, what, for, for whatever reason, um, unwittingly or even a, a, a bias a racism may do things differently to different people book people in different orders and, and so on and I just wondered how you thought we you're sort of starting to present the evidence and the data around it and I'm just interested in bringing it back to a research question of why those things exist and then ultimately what we might do to tackle them because we're in a busy trust we can absolutely adopt different strategies 
for different types of people yeah if that works so um i think i think the other hypothesis i'd probably add as well is that is that the the issue is one about um deprivation rather than ethnicity specifically um and certainly if you look at variation by deprivation you see you know huge huge and systematic differences um and i think unfortunately from a research point of view a lot of these things do interact um so some of the reasons why people might not come forward for elective care might be because they you know they're too busy worrying about um finding a job paying the gas bill you know they're not prioritizing health and um engaging with the health service as anyone who's who's had to do it knows does require quite a lot of effort and persistence um sometimes um and and so some of these you know things are going to be um are going to be challenging um when we uh when we did our analysis and saw the variations um pre-covid the first thing we did was went to see if there was existing epidemiological evidence that might explain it um, um and uh you know that might explain either that it's genetic or that there are you know there's already work done and we already know it um and i think i was surprised for many of those elective care procedures that there wasn't that data um i think in terms of the the access issues i think the thing that really needs to um be taken into account is what the change is in terms of pathways that uh are are being introduced or at what points people are, are falling out of care so you know are they getting the care in primary care but they're not getting it in hospital care so i think some of that pathway analysis can help to work out where some of those things are um and then i think the conscious and unconscious bias is is itself a kind of a, a whole research area so i i suppose i feel from the work that we've done is we're sort of just really at the beginning of a lot of this work um uh and there are other kinds of research methodology that perhaps might be better uh able to highlight where to go next with it so more qualitative methods um mm. um uh, might be one area so um but you're right we could talk about that um for an awful long time um i think in terms of just the linking um so i mean we're keen to we've uh been starting to publish our code recently so we're keen that people you know use that um and we're keen to do events like this to understand how how we can um how the work we do can can sort of be be more useful um i completely recognize what you say about the the challenge of of doing the day of doing the day job um so keen to you know for us as an organization to be involved in in mm. thinking about how we can how we can facilitate that um and in terms of you know your feedback's really helpful as well in terms of our outputs can we make them more easily accessible we did actually with the rho put together a kind of you know a 10 point summary um which i'll i'll find in a minute and pop a link into the chat as well um which uh perhaps is a little bit more easily digestible i know one of the things that i found when i work locally in a system is that it's it's really useful to have something that you can take that can you can engage senior leaders with quite quickly you're not going to get them to read um much as we love our 50 page reports you're not going to get them to read that report but what can you get them to look at that will engage them so i think that's something that we could perhaps think about a bit more well we'd be very happy to be a pilot maybe mm -hmm. offline and try and get that working better so john i think um john bibby's made the point that um thinking about the kind of demand and supply issues that um may be playing out is also important and add add to that in terms of um the notion of demand the 
health beliefs and um, ideas about health that dominate in different um, communities play into how readily people will or won't um, uh, how they define illness for themselves and what they will and won't um, use as a motivator to um, seek help and as we've identified age as being a really important um, kind of confounder um, when we're doing this work and the other one I'd add to that is sex the um, um, expectations of what women can and can't do within different communities by themselves and independently um, varies hugely and that can also be a confounding factor in kind of what shows up as um, access. So I think um, it's probably time to shift to um, to you, Mark. And I don't know if as part of what you're talking about, whether you're also going to touch on how we can um, how we can make it easier to get fuller um, and more accurate um, categorization of um of ethnicity uh, but if not that's probably something we want to kind of um come back to towards the end of the discussion yeah no absolutely Sophia and I, I've put a link in the chat which is a session we did a, a little while ago now um which we actually used right at the height of COVID for allocating ethnicity uh, from Sophia plus Christie um, instead of what you'd entered on the census and that, that comes with some sensitivities hence your smile um, but there's quite an evidence base actually for using that and and down in East Kent for example in Ashford we have a huge Polish population and a huge Nepalese population and I'm not convinced that the census categories give me everything I need to analyze and plan for those people as best they can so um, there's, a, there's a link in there but we can we can always come back to that um, I thought what I would try and do for 10 or 15 minutes is just signpost a lot of the work that we've done and give a kind of local context for how we've um, applied this, you know, with 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 those those busy sort of day to day demands. Uh, I mean, I have a particular research interest in this anyway, but um, I'm very lucky to have some very good staff here who've helped put a whole series of resources together. So the first thing we did was, if, if you can kind of see all that on screen, is kind of went off and did all of the desk research about um, what are the key reports coming out. Um, you know, and the, these are just kind of examples of them at the top, uh, some quite recent stuff from NHS Confed that's come out, um, advising boards on how they should assure their local population um, of their work around inequalities. But, you know, the work that Sarah's done and uh, examples like this coming out from NHS England, there's, there's plenty of them. Um, and, and we just gathered all that together in, in, in this, if you can see it OK, which is a kind of an internal Wikipedia thing that we use that just comes as part of Microsoft. And Taz, I can send you all of this so we can publish all of this on the internet uh, and write it up, which will be helpful, I hope. Um, so that Pete and the whole point of these sessions is people don't start from scratch every time. So here's all of the work that we've done. Here's all of the work that Sarah's done. Here's all of Sarah's code on GitHub. You're already starting at quite a mature level. One of the, a plug to make for something we're going to do in a few months is to look at reproduced analytical pipelines around inequalities specifically, because when you get into that lovely word in the chat intersectionality um, we really need to be working together to think about how we code some of this so when you get down in here um, and start looking at inequalities there's a there's a whole range of different um, types of ways of calculating that um, there's three here just just straight off the bat um, there is plenty of evidence um, of inequalities here so these are these are different areas um, with the percentage of you know numbers of people waiting for over 52 weeks on the y-axis and that level of deprivation along the bottom when we get into sharing code we need to be very careful how stable those populations are in terms of their level of, of deprivation um, and when you apply in this example just ind as opposed to the areas themselves you you see quite clear patterns quite quickly but I think Sarah's point about the, the new census coming out helps kind of fairly regularly stabilise some of this data as we go along, because uh, in parts of Kent, for example, we see quite big population movements out of London down into the Medway towns. And we need to be very careful how we're describing an area um, contextually now, as opposed to what the census thought of it a few years ago. Um, so uh, 
hang on if I just because the screen's got a bit small so what we then did is this and this is helpful we can um, share this again we convened because you have a governance structure within a trust we convened um, a new committee um, inequalities and unwanted variation very happy to share this I've got a call tomorrow with another trust who want to put something in place um, we'll we'll share all of this with people why we're doing this type of work what we're aiming to do with it and and kind of our journey and I, and I think as Sarah was alluding to knowing where to start on this stuff is actually quite difficult so what we thought we would do we picked a few key areas um, but we've actually started with the constitutional standards so we've looked at how long people are waiting in ED we've looked at how long people are waiting for elective surgery uh, we're looking at the cancer standards and those types of things and we're going to start to cut those by age by gender by deprivation by traveler status um, and then start to look at the intersectionality around them and I think one of the key points I would make is that we are we're you know quite a large trust with a large information team we wouldn't always have those I'll call them data science skills to analyze intersectionality very easily I can kind of just about say it I haven't got a team of people behind me who can start to pull that type of data out so we 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 advertised a role last week of a kind of data scientist to start to recruit people who are confident in standardizing data sets building out some quite simple regression um, but the more we share code around this stuff the easier that will get as well because there is a huge variability in terms of workforce in just being able to analyze some of this um, so we stood that committee up um, <clears throat> we then have a uh, meeting every two months this is just to prove that that exists uh, run all through these kind of local um, sites on confluence so i'm going to uh, share a different screen now bear with me I'll just take you and show you a couple of bits of data and I'll see Taz I can see you on screen can you see my PowerPoint now okay yeah we can yeah great okay so um, again I I, th I think a really key point in this um, and now the is, is this idea intersectionality starts to describe it a little bit is and I've used HSMR as a as a kind of analogy. So in a hospital, you could count how many people die each day. Um, and if Taz and I ran two different hospitals, you could compare us on our crude mortality rates. Now, Taz might admit just um, elderly people. She might run a hospital in Eastbourne um, and I might run a hospital in East London um, and, you know, see completely different types of people come through it so you have to come up with an adjusted measure of mortality so that you can compare hospitals fairly and that might take into account things like age and gender and deprivation and the type of admission you made your charleston score which is a kind of measure of acute uh, comorbidities and so on and and we've we for better or for worse we've we've been trying to do that over the last 20 years or so with things like hsmrs for inequalities we're going to have to do exactly the same and I think there is a risk um, on the left of this chart um, that people ask for relatively crude data. So can you tell me last month how many people fell over by gender? It, it, it's meaningless because we would have people of a certain gender admitted on two particular wards. Um, in that example, men might be frailer than women. Um, to get to a point where you're checking if fall, say, or harm or mortality or long length of stays fall evenly across different groups of people you immediately have to get into much more sophisticated statistical techniques than are used usually within a local trust so we've come up with this idea of a kind of maturity level for this so you know simply starting with crude data on the left working through techniques like spc and xmr charts and so on um, then getting into um, sort of factor analysis and starting to do regression and and trying to come up overall with some sort of measure of inequality that you can that multifaceted you can apply to any measure um, and the way we've structured that is to look at three areas and this is in line with what's been kind of recommended nationally and that is to start with access then look at experience patient experience and then look at outcomes and because you can't have an experience or an outcome until you have access uh, we've landed the governance for this around our chief operating officer and, and as Sarah was showing in some of her slides until we start to you know dent that elective recovery um, we won't there's no point looking at 
outcomes because we just need to get the people through the system. So access is the place that we will start. Um, and we started to do some analysis on that. Um, it, it, as Sarah and I have sort of said throughout, you need to heavily caveat this work because we're kind of right at the beginning of it, I think. So there's a chart here. We've got a funnel plot on screen here and a table next to it. And that shows you, and this is back to John's point earlier, the one is the highest level of inequality, the highest level of deprivation. So we've looked at children who DNA, who don't come in for their outpatient appointment. Um, and the higher the level of deprivation, the more likely those children are and their families to not turn up to their outpatient appointment. So in this chart with deciles on the left and an index of 134, if you're from the poorest background, you're a third more likely to not come in for your outpatient appointment. If you're from the wealthiest decile, you're a quarter more likely to turn up. And a funnel plot shows that some of those are outside of three standard deviations and feel significant. And the that what we're now in a stage out of saying, if we think this looks right and robust, what could we do differently? So could we have a strategy A for certain people, which is a letter. Strategy B is a letter plus a phone call. Strategy C is a letter plus a phone call plus a text message. And letter D sends a, uh, strategy D sends a taxi for them as well. Um, so some anecdotal research that we've looked at locally with um, travelers. So we have a, a quite a large traveler population in Kent is that uh, because of the sometimes chaotic nature of those lifestyles, if we call people on the day and say, you need to come in today, for your outpatient appointment that is much more successful than even texting them the day before or writing to them a week before that um so um that there there, there is something in this and we need to you know with people like sarah's help drill further down into this um i would say that when you start to get into properly adjusted data so this is a uh, an adjusted hospital st standardized mortality metric um and i've used um stroke as an example and I've split it by uh, quintiles for deprivation. We see no pattern. And, it, and everything that we've looked at, when we've looked at it properly adjusted, we have not seen any bias yet. So a lot of the stuff I've shown you before has been at a relatively crude level by gender, by age, by deprivation. When you combine all of these metrics together, we have not yet found something that is significant, which is good, um, but we'll kind of keep looking. So what this chart is showing here is for those quintiles, your chances of death, mortality, um, do not vary according to your um, socioeconomic background. But there's a lot to do. Um, and it's, we thought we would start with the constitutional standards and we'd take advice from Sarah and others about whether that's the right place to start or, um, or, or to go in completely different directions. But that's where we have started. Um, the other thing I just wanted to uh, mention quickly, Sophia, and I've got a, a link to it if I share from a different place. Uh, un unfortunately, Daniel couldn't join us um, from Coventry and Warwick. They've done a, a very high profile piece of work where they have sought to uh, reorder their waiting list for elective work by taking into account a whole range of factors about people. And this, these are, these are his slides uh, this has all been published and I'll, again, I'll send it to you, Taz, so we can put it all, all kind of in one place. Um, but as you come back from uh, COVID and, and from elective and, and into elective recovery, we need to do two things. We need to make sure that the restoration of services doesn't make inequalities worse. And we also then potentially can go on to consider if we could restore in a way that actually reduces inequalities. So I've got a graph here, which is a bit like Sarah's, which says the risk is as the activity comes back, the health gap increases. Um, and Daniel illustrates this with a, a kind of a nice simple example here, uh, which we were starting to mention in our previous conversation of they've sort of characterized as kind of William from Warwick and Norman from Nuneaton. So, you know, someone like myself and a lot of us, uh, you know, uh, middle class people sat on a Teams or a Zoom link, relatively straightforward to dive off for an outpatient appointment or to call a GP, chase a GP up. Uh, if you're lucky enough, go and visit a GP and so on. Uh, much more difficult if you're building brick walls for a living or driving a bus um, or working in a shop. Um, and by characterizing these in this kind of 
quite simplistic way, I think the aim from that trust is to is to demonstrate the the risks of making sure that these people kind of come back in the same way. Um, so um, wanted to wanted to just um, do it in that way, Sophia, if that's all right. It's just it's just rattle around a lot of sources, all of which we'll publish and we'll link together and try and make it um, coherent in a blog. Um, we're right at the beginning of this. I think a key point from us, which I mentioned at the beginning, is very interested in looking at ethnicity in a slightly more sophisticated way, particularly in, in an area like ours, which is predominantly white, but there's subtleties within that. <clears throat> and I think an example I gave before when I worked in a, a testing centre for COVID is as people walked in, they were asked if they if they were white British, almost as though that was an exam question. And you could see people thinking, yes if i say yes do i get the jab i mean i'm technically of turkish cypriot heritage but i if if you want me to say i'm white british to get you know and I, and i and we sort of stopped him and then you you just ask people what their ethnicity is you can't you can't ask them it like it's an exam question so we're we're kind of right at the beginning of this um as a trust we've stood up some governance we've stood up some analysis i think we need a bit need to work harder to take data from people you know take code and and finding some people like sarah try and apply it locally where we can um but the nice thing that we are then able to do is we're able to test out different strategies so um, um the the i the holy grail to this is that we kind of absorb sarah and lizzie's data and then run different strategies and test them out and create control groups and and do proper evaluation with guidance on evaluation methodology and so on we're not at that point yet but we're hoping to get there as as kind of quick as we can um so i hope that's okay for you i've kind of rattled around some of that just to keep us on time that's great and mark could you just say a little bit more though about the processes you now have in the trust for capturing ethnicity so um i think we've just had a, a comment about um, that difficulty of, you know, in a reception area being asked to announce what you are, which is, you know, typically the way that the NHS has done it for the last 30 years. So as, as part of your new approach in Kent, have you started, um, you know, have you started using the, um, the sort of allocation, the code to allocate if people aren't announcing, have you got um, a different way of doing it or do you still start with the clerk asking and then fill in the gaps afterwards? Yeah, so, so a couple of points to that. One is we're trying to, uh, it, it's, it's recorded relatively well in hospitals, um, particularly compared to GPs. Um, so it's not too bad. Um, we, uh, wherever we can, we ask people to um, create that data themselves, themselves, which might be handing them an iPad or a form, which is then like, as opposed to asking them and putting them on the spot and creating a difficult conversation for both people. So wherever we can, we ask them to do it themselves. Um, and that seems better. I think you also get into some IG territory. Um, so where we have a Kent and Medway care record, which links together GP, community, acute, and so on and so on, where it's not recorded well in one, say GP land, are they allowed to look across into our record and potentially poll the spine as well to see what comes back? And we think we can do that. We're just working through the IG of that because if you volunteered your ethnicity to someone in a hospital, but you haven't volunteered it to someone in a GP, is it okay for us to share it with them for what we call secondary use of data? So we're just working through that. What, what was really exciting, and we are trying it again now is of course during COVID there was a copy notice which meant that we were allowed to move much more quickly on this so we tried out the the Sophia plus Christie method because we needed to know that week we couldn't wait weeks and weeks for committees to pontificate on things we needed to know that week if we should pull back from ITU some of our black staff mm. so we profiled their names we profiled the names of staff and we profiled the names of patients under the copy notice and we're able to make sort of really fast tactical decisions um, coming out of covid we're now having to do it, go through as we should all of the right kind of um, uh, data protection impact assessments and so on to see if that's okay um, and we're doing a lot of patient and public engagement alongside that as you'd expect most people are supportive of this but you have to make sure that you're out there telling enough people this is what we're doing with your data because we you know you've volu you volunteered your data because you've come to an outpatient appointment you haven't 
consciously volunteered in that moment for it to be used for 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 Sarah or for me. Um, so we need to do two things: make 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 it really clear, put lots and lots of comms out. Um, so yeah, I mean that that it, it's it's a really interesting area because it it takes you into quite sensitive areas. But I, you know, I'm a kind of data saves lives proponent, so I think there is merit in linking data but you've got to take people with you and explain what you're doing so i think that links back to the notion of um when we're volunteering information it becoming clearer all the time that that then updates the nhs spine and or nhs slash social care core yeah. data yeah. and taking every opportunity on that and i guess the more you can do mark with if you find a way through some of the more labyrinthine aspects of ig on this sharing that so we're not everyone isn't having to reinvent the wheel and go through their own no path. no I, I agree i mean one we we, we are going to run a, a rap event in may uh, which is related to this try and you know get people sharing code more aggressive. one of the ideas we had was reproducible ig so if someone has solved that labyrinth in Kent or wherever, don't let someone else start all the way right down the beginning. You know, the example we always give is the, the work we did around domestic abuse, linking police data and NHS data. We solved that IG conundrum and we're really happy to share our approach. And already we've got a couple of other areas that are kind of interested in pursuing that. But we just want this, we want the pace quicker. We don't want everyone kind of just starting from scratch each time going. Oh, I've been asked to do some work around inequalities. What shall I go and get? I want them to immediately have access to everything that Sarah's done, everything that I've done, all the reproducible IG. So they're kind of off and running a bit more quickly. Fabulous. So that date um, for people who are interested on um, reproducible analytic pipelines, which is our latest uh, three letter acronym to get excited about, is on the 10th of May. Um, and that's like this one's a kind of open event. So you can sign up for that on the ODSL um, website. And um, we've got lots of resources that have gone up on the um, chat. We can presumably post those onto the website as part of the write up of, um, um, of this event. And um, can I just check whether um, there's any final burning question or comment before we close? And I can't see everyone's hands at the moment, but feel free. We've got a question about inf <laughs> IG is information governance and Sorry. you live in a very privileged world. Sorry. You have not come head to head with NHS information governance procedures. Lucky person. Um, great. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for um, attending. There's a load of rich resources um, there that we'll be um, posting. And if you haven't had a look on the Nuffield site, it's definitely um, worth doing that. There's all of um, Sarah's and Liz's work, but lots of um, other fascinating reports and information there as well. And um, Mark and Taz are regularly up so there's lots of um, links up there as well and um, hopefully we'll look forward to seeing you all on the 10th of May thank you thanks Sophia